My name is Alexander Vercru. I'm the Executive Director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University, and I'm thrilled today to be presenting a discussion of our podcast, How to Kill a Superpower. We've got two of the leading actors or the leading uh, designers of this podcast with us today, Yelena Bieberman and Zach Trojanovsky, and one of our RECA master students, Arujan Mar. Mar Mikhanova is going to be asking the questions. So let me introduce them briefly, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to Arjan to ask the questions. Dr. Yelena Bieberman is a graduate of our master's program from 2006. She's an associate professor of political science at Skidmore College, and her latest book is Gambling with Violence, State Outsourcing of War in Pakistan and India, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2019. She has published in a lot of academic journals, which I'm not going to list, uh, and she also worked as a journalist in Moscow, Russia, and you'll learn a lot more about her if you listen to the podcast. Zach Trojanovsky is a late Soviet era researcher. He's an audio engineer. He's also co-host of the podcast, How to Kill a Superpower, Lessons from the USSR. And he's the co-founder and head of the publishing for Forte Creative Group, which is a multi-stakeholder music cooperative in the capital region of New York. Arjan Mirkhanova got her undergraduate degree in political science and international relations from Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. She has participated in a lot of different programs, including interning at the Central Asian Bureau for Analytic Reporting, but she's now a graduate student in Harvard's uh, RICA program, which is regional studies uh, for Russia, Central Asia, and Eastern Europe. And she's intending to continue studying Central Asia and Russia, focusing on foreign policy and regional organizations. We're going to be talking today about How to Kill a Superpower, which is our podcast put together by Zach and Yelena. And just to give you a little bit of a taste, a scientist, an Irish poet, and a man who slips between raindrops walk into a hunting lodge in the Bielowieża forest in Soviet Belarus. They don't know it yet, but they're about to kill a superpower. The five-part podcast tells the story of this mysterious weekend in December 1991, 30 years ago, which ended in the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So Arjan, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Please ask us some great questions. Uh, thank you so much, Alexandra. To begin with, I'm honored to be part of this important and timely discussion. And thank you, Dr. Bieberman and Zach for conveying the story of this fateful weekend in Belavesia in such an entertaining manner. I uh, found it particularly fascinating that you uh, centered each episode on a particular Belavesia specific theme, but you also raised broader questions on the structure agency problem, the role of spontaneity, external powers, and personalities in shaping history. So how did you come up with this idea of uh, framing each episode around a particular theme? And why did you choose podcast as a format to convey your thoughts on Belavesia? Why don't we start with Zach and then Dr. Bieberman could follow up. Oh. Sure. Uh, so when it comes to the, the individual episode topics, that was definitely a very varied process uh, in that some of these topics, like spontaneity, we set out from the beginning, uh, knowing that that was something we wanted to cover, particularly because in the field of political science, there is not a lot of focus on spontaneity as a legitimate factor in these uh, sorts of uh, arenas. But when it came to some of the other themes that came with research and a, a lot of brainstorming, uh, over the summer, we would spend a lot of time in Professor Bierman's office, kind of writing out all of the major points we wanted to cover. And then we'd write out however many topics we could possibly think of and you know try to file it all away. Uh, so it definitely was something that we didn't start with six topics and just you know go from there. It was, it was a process, um, but yeah. Yes, and I'd like to add that it was iterative, right? Kind of going back to the drawing board, uh, trying different things, taking lots of risks, uh, taping ourselves, seeing how things sound. And there was a big um, uh, role of spontaneity, just kind of allowing things to, to unfold and seeing where things take us. So kind of, kind of bringing that academic rigor, combining it with um, sort of creativity and just being open to learning, to making mistakes, trying again. We had the entire summer to do it. Um, and it was, it was also a very personal project for both uh, Zach and myself. It was a chance for us to kind of answer some questions we had for ourselves, like what the hell happened <laughs> 30 years ago? Like, um, and just something that 
seemed impossible, especially when you look at the documents, uh, and we'll, we can talk more about that later, the CIA documents and what the Americans were thinking, at least, and what the Soviets were thinking, to something that is now treated as inevitable. And in connection to that kind of personal side, we actually have a video we'd like to share. Um, it's about four minutes long. Um, so, Zach, if you could please. And Zach, if you'd like to kind of explain just a little bit what this video is about. Yeah, sure. So uh, the slideshow that we're about to show uh, kind of touches on this personal aspect to us. Uh, the podcast is, you know, equal parts about our own personal stories and our experiences with the Soviet Union, both as, you know, an immigrant from it and myself as a first generation American. And so when we're having this event where we're kind of approaching it in this analytical historical way, we wanted to make sure to retain that personal side of it and, and not, you know, have this sort of faceless analysis of it. Um, so the slideshow we're about to show uh, includes some audio from the podcast, as well as some photos uh, from both of our families back in the Soviet Union. So uh, I'll share that right now. I still remember the old address. I still remember the old phone number. How can I be a stranger when I still remember everything? Мой адрес не дома, не улица. Мой адрес Советский Союз. My address is neither a house nor a street. My address is USSR. People who lived through that try to find that point of balance of, you know, not buying into this this idea that it was all evil and all rotten and of course it had to collapse and that's why it did, but saying that this was our life and this, you know, it meant something real takeaway for me is like, what is American greatness? And it's like, it lies in the ordinary. That's, that's the greatness. It's not, you know, Statue of Liberty. It's not the tower. It's not all these political things. It's like, it's the fact that we have 15 Jell-O pudding pops, you know, like that, that ended communism. Like that's so wild. Союз, мой адрес не дом, не улица, мой адрес Советский Союз, мой адрес не дом, не улица, мой адрес Советский Союз, мой адрес не дом, не улица, мой адрес Советский Союз, мой адрес не дом, не улица, мой адрес Советский
Krista, moja Krista, ludzki sojusz. I'm gonna have that song in my head like for the next decade. <laughs> it's very catchy. Year, it's, yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, amazing. Thank you for this excellent video. I think it sets a great tone for the rest of the discussion. Uh, I'd like now to shift our conversation to discussing what actually happened in Belavesha and the significance of these events. So in the fifth episode, you discuss how the events in Belavesha are defined, arguing that there is a lack of consensus on what actually uh, Belavesha was. Uh, assessments range from collusion to conspiracy to coup or revolution from above. And you argue, Dr. Biberman, that when we give something a name, we make it more visible and analyzable. Which term, in your opinion, more accurately reflects what happened in Belavesha, and in what way do these challenges with conceptualization make the events in Belavesha less visible in the public discourse? Well, this is a great question, and the way you framed that is perfect. Um, you know, I'm still at a place where I'm not sure, and it's an uncomfortable place to be as an academic, as a political scientist, but um, I was kind of hoping this podcast would help me to figure it out. And I'm still a little bit of confusion right now. I would be leaning towards some sort of elite uh, level collusion. And again, again, and the reason I'm not sure is because of spontaneity, right? Was it pre-planned? It was not pre-planned. But, you know, change and revolutions happen spontaneously, right? The, the, and the, so it's, 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 you know, maybe we need to come up with a new term for something like this. I mean, it's, it's potentially rare. Um, that uh, something like this could happen where at the, high, at the highest level uh, elites come together and just sort of decide to, to take away power from the center and give it to themselves. Um, so some sort of elite level collusion. The, the outcome was revolutionary, but was it a revolution? Um, you know, the term top-down revolution has been used and applied to this. Um, so again, Good question. I would love to kind of brainstorm with all of you <laughs> and get your ideas. What do you What do you think? Uh, what would you call it? Uh, th that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of thoughts on this. I would agree with you mainly. The outcome was revolutionary, but it's really not clear whether there is a great term existing in academia that could describe these events. I wonder what Zach thinks on this. Um, yeah. Well, so I. I also don't know if there's a term. I sorry to be you know the third person here expressing that I, I'm not sure of the term, uh, but something that I, I was thinking about with regard to sort of this moment in the series uh, that I recently re-listened to the interview that I conducted with with coup expert Erica De Bruin uh, to listen to some of the parts of it that didn't end up in the podcast, and one of the things that we talked about a lot was the call placed uh, to the Minister of Defense Shaposhnikov directly after the decision, the, the treaty, the accords were signed. Um, and that to her seemed to signal uh, a coup in that in coups, it's a very common move to you know, place a call or, or let the military know, even if you're not expecting any proactive military behavior. Um, so I think that is sort of one of the arguments for this does resemble a coup, but obviously there are many other reasons why we can't you know, just go straight forward and call it that. But what that has made me think about in, in the past couple of weeks is whether or not the calls placed after an event like this, which we spent so much time analyzing in this podcast, whether that is something that looking at other coup incidents or other you know, top-down revolutions, whatever you want to call it, is that another angle to start to analyze and maybe you know, label these sorts of events? Um, I don't have too many other examples on hand right now, but I, I've just been interested in you know, whether or not that's a, a new way to look at these things. You know, one thing that's interesting is that the idea of a coup implies that the, the coup plotters have an idea of what they're going to do. And one of the things that's so interesting in your podcast is that so much happens kind of by accident or by the seat of one's pants. 
And it really makes you think about, you know, whether Tolstoy was right about saying that the great man theory is basically garbage, right? Like people are swayed by external events. They want a good gas deal or they're worried about controlling nationalism and they're not thinking about some grand scheme to end the Soviet Union. They're just solving kind of small problems that end up looking like they're making history. Um, and I was just wondering if, if, you know, Yelena, if you've thought about whether or not, you know, this kind of contributes to that debate about whether great men make history or whether they're just, you know, subject to the vagaries of what happens like everyone else. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, so that's another big question that we thought about. Um, of course, you know, also Karl Marx has the famous quote about the role of structure and history in sort of shaping uh, our behaviors. And especially, and Tolstoy also pointed out sort of the more power you have, the less control you have over your faith and what you end up doing. And this is the view that Yeltsin reminded us about in his um, memoir, said, well, don't blame me. <laughs> you know, there's little control that I ultimately have. Um, I, I, yeah, but, you know, agency is there, um, you know, <sighs> In, you know, Yeltsin did not have to agree to, to the dissolution. Um, I mean, there was such a momentum though. I, I remember uh, Shushkevich when uh, Burbulis, um, Yeltsin's right-hand man, when he um, suggested, hey guys, you wanna dissolve the Soviet Union? Immediately Shushkevich, the Belarusian leader said, yeah, sounds great. And he only said it because he thought everyone else was gonna do it. And he wanted to be the first one to say yes. And so we don't know what the others would have done, but once he said yes, it kind of cascaded. So in that moment, you could say maybe they had very little agency, but, uh, but you know, history also just doesn't happen in those moments. There's a lot of moments leading up to it where there is more degree of agency, you know, for Yeltsin to even choose to pursue a political career and, and the way he's, he uh, took advantage of important moments, like getting on, on top of that tank, that was completely him. The tank did not make him do it, right? Um, and, 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 and get the, the credit, uh, public credit for kind of, uh, thwarting the communist coup in August of 1991. So that was all him. Um, so it's kind of this weird interaction, but what's the important takeaway is there are moments where it seems like people have very little control and and, and then there's this cascade effect. And, and just like what Zach said in the beginning, as social scientists, political scientists, we, we don't appreciate that enough. We, we assume we can explain things away. I would have to say also as someone who's very involved in administration and in meetings and things like that, like there's sometimes, you know, a chemistry in a meeting that makes things happen that wouldn't have happened if that meeting hadn't taken place, right? So there is kind of the interaction of structure and situation that then combines to empower individuals in a particular moment when they do things that they might not have thought about, you know, 20 minutes or an hour or a day before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and it's more than just structure. It's not like, yeah, there are these large forces, but again, the, the moments, uh, the momentum, like the psychic forces around, there's just these intangible things that uh, Tolstoy was very sensitive to himself and he was reminding us in War and Peace. <laughs> now that we're discussing this structure and agency problem, I just recall that Zach, in the first episode, you said that prior to the podcast, you had assumed that the USSR was doomed to failure. Has the podcast transformed this assumption in any way, and in general, the way you now think about the collapse of the Soviet Union? Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. And I, I think that it, I might have been exaggerating a little in that, you know, obviously I graduated with a political science degree. I wasn't, you know, just completely assuming that this was 100% uh, inevitable. But I think one of the most powerful things to me about my participation and in this process and in the podcast was sort of coming up against this US narrative of the Soviet Union. Um, and that's why, you know, throughout the podcast, I kind of always come back to that. Um, as a first generation American, I think that that narrative plays a very, has always played a very big part of my life because, you know, even though my family is Russian, I'm raised in an environment where I'm sort of surrounded by that. And my identity as, as a Russian is dictated by the narrative of the place that I, I was raised. Um, so I, you know, even though obviously I, I understand that the, so, or I always understood that the Soviet Union collapsing was not inevitable to be able to examine that in a more concrete sense in like a moment to moment basis and, and try to find, you know, faults in it, what was very, that, that was definitely my favorite part of the, making the podcast. 
If I could come in, it's interesting because there, there has been a generational shift. I can feel it even now. So for Zach to say, well, I, I understood that it wasn't necessarily inevitable. It's kind of amazing and surprising to me still because I, I belong to a generation where, yeah, I, even though I was from there and I kind of got a sense of things, once I came to US and I went to high school here, yeah, it was kind of, I was led to believe it was inevitable. Of course, the US, you know, the best, most powerful country, like, sort of the, the city on the shining hill and it was going to win the war and you know the, the whole system was going to collapse so it was just I, I bought so much into it and still now it's sort of part of my um it's sort of this internal identity and uh, so it's something that I constantly have to remind myself like oh wait like we did this research and you know these these things happen but but my instinct is always to kind of go along with the, the way that I was uh, raised here in the U.S. as, as part of my my generation. Uh Great, thank you so much. And uh, now coming back to this, the, the events of August that you described, uh, Dr. Bieberman, Belovesh, of course, have received very little attention in history textbooks, because I remember from my own school experience and in the overall narrative of the Soviet collapse compared to say the August Putsch. How do the Belovesh accounts, uh, accords fit into the broader uh, chain of events precipitating the Soviet collapse? And did the events in Belovesh merely conclude and formalize what was by then a reality? Or were they really a catalyst force behind the Soviet Union's collapse? What do you think, Dr. Bureau? Yeah, another great question. So there is a narrative that, well, you know, the Belovesh Accords, they were sort of just the nail in the coffin. So it was, it was again, it was inevitable. It was just going to happen. Isn't this, isn't this obvious, right? Um, but knowing what we know about the, the different actors who went into it, not thinking they were going to do it, it's not something that entered their mind. And certainly Gorbachev did not think they were going to do it, right? Like he was shocked. And President George H.W. Uh, Bush was shocked. Everyone was shocked by this. That just tells me like it wasn't so much a nail in the coffin. It was a very critical moment uh, without which there would be no dissolution of the Soviet Union. So I think it's such a central moment that has been completely ignored by history. I think one reason I kind of I must have read somewhere and remembered it was because it they happened on December 8th. And December 8th is, is also when my family arrived in the United States as refugees. So that date was seared in my memory. And so it's like, okay, December 8th, that's important. They're like, otherwise maybe I also would have like just never thought of them. Uh, Zach, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that after having done this research, I definitely agree that it, it wasn't really a nail in the coffin. Um, but I think a big part of what we do in our podcast when we're presenting this context is to show that, you know, it's not, it doesn't happen in a void. There are these contextual factors. But at the end of the day, you know, the events that took place, I mean, we show so many times that even throughout the course of that weekend, you know, things could have gone differently. So to, you know, call, I, I think that by the time they arrived at that cabin, there was no certainty that, you know, this was going to be any sort of ending. Yeah. You're right. You know, one thing I found particularly striking about one of the episodes uh, of the podcast is that you really come up with this account that challenges the conventional wisdom, you know, which holds that Yeltsin called Bush before Gorbachev, thereby offending the latter. Shushkevich, however, said that this had been a total happenstance. There was no intention to contact the White House first. And then you say that based on Sergei Plohi's account, uh, the leaders were basically aware of Nazarbayev's decision not to come to the Viscoli Lodge. And the only win-win option for Yeltsin was to call Bush before Gorbachev and lie about Nazarbayev's cooperation. By this time, by the time you know, the leaders had reached Gorbachev, they would already have the backing of the international community, uh, thereby, you know, tying Gorbachev's hands to a certain extent. How does this evidence fit into the theme of spontaneity that you explore uh, during the third episode? Yeah, but, um, so it's interesting, sort of, yeah, Zach was sort of this master of trying to sort of figure out like what happened, why it happened in those precise moments. Was there a strategy behind it that the Bush was called before Gorbachev? Uh, and, you know, th there's definitely, it was, it was a sort of a, a brilliant strategic move for the reason that you said that now US knows and it's okay with it. And so Gorbachev has no choice. Um, on the other hand, was it 
something that sort of happened uh, by coincidence that they ended up they ended up reaching Bush before Gorbachev, which is what um, the Belarusian leader Shushkevich said that they didn't mean to. They they were trying to reach Gorbachev, they just couldn't get to him fast enough, and. Um, so that we don't know, we weren't there, right? Um, and we can't unfortunately ask Yeltsin. Um, what, and I think, you, you know, know, what, what Shushkevich and Burbulis have said is that they were trying to reach Bush and uh, Gorbachev at the same time, and Gorbachev wouldn't take the call, right? And somehow they ended up getting through to Bush faster <laughs> because he would take the call. <laughs> I think many of us have had an experience where we missed the call and we're like, oh, damn it. <laughs> Like this was an important. If we'd known one. you were dissolving the Soviet Union, we would have taken it. <laughs> She's yeah. like, oh, well, I'm sure this is something that would very much frustrate Gorbachev to hear that account and to say, well, if he just came fast, you know, it's like it was like it was easier to reach Bush. So I can, you know, I, maybe, um, you know. So I, I just remember actually in uh, one of Shushevich's accounts, he recalls that when they placed the call to Gorbachev, there was actually uh, like an administrative person who had to verify. Shushkevich's identity before he put the call through. Uh, I don't know if that is just, you know, an excuse or whatever it could be, but I, I'm interested because this is like a nameless individual that suddenly we realize has played, you know, a, a crucial role in this like pivotal moment. And, and I just want to say that Yelena will have a chance to ask Shushkevich outright next Wednesday at 1230 Boston time. We're actually having a um, podcast or a, a webinar with Shushkevich with Yelena asking him questions and we'll have a translator and we can get to the bottom of this question to the extent that Shushkevich knows he might not actually know the answers to this. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So Yeltsin is either a brilliant strategist or just a very lucky man. <laughs> But it's funny because that moment, had he reached Gorbachev first, let's say, you know, maybe Gorbachev could have acted. Uh, one thing that we heard was that um, the the uh, the um, Bilaveja was um, the, the hunting lodge was surrounded by KGB, and maybe he could have stopped the whole thing, right? And then very different um, history would have unfolded. And especially if Gorbachev was somebody like, you know, the current president of Russia. He could have still acted, but he, you know, Gorbachev played a very important role in sort of the peaceful end of the Soviet Union, which is ironic because he's the one who, you know, he was trying to reform it and change it, not end it. And yet he actually, unbeknownst to him, also without any agency, <laughs> he played an important role in that in that in the dissolution. So the same know, thing that, with Bush, yeah. <laughs> that reminds me, I wanted to ask you the question: like, you know, you lived in Minsk, right, when this happened. Um, and I understand you were quite young, but I think what got you interested in this was that you had no idea that sort of the country was being dissolved while you were going to, I don't know, Detsky Sad or something. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, actually, I lived in Babruisk, which uh -huh. is Megilovska Oblast, so not even, in, you know, not in the capital, but it was a pretty big town. Um, so, you know, the news would have reached us. It was important. Um, but yeah, nobody around me, my family, we, we didn't. We didn't know what was happening. Uh, so much was happening so quickly. I think people were kind of just really focused in the material kind of situation, you know, just getting food on the table. Um, it's just like even personal security issues, you know, just, um, just kind of surviving uh, day to day. So like maybe they weren't paying attention to the news, but I don't think it was advertised. I mean, obviously this was kind of happened in secret. Um, but how, how do you get interested in sort of this, yeah. this particular moment? I mean, I know, I know. you're a political scientist and, and it's kind of a watershed moment, but, you know, what, what is the kind of the intersection of the, mm -hmm. the personal and the academic for you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I can ask myself and I think one explanation was um, is because of what's happening right now with the United States. It's a moment of transition. Something big seems to be happening. And again, I remember that feeling as a child uh, that Soviet Union was collapsing, but we didn't know that. Like, I remember that feeling. Um, just not knowing what's going to happen. And, and then the pandemic hit um, and sort of a lot, there's just so many parallels with my experience and the way that people kind of felt towards the government that the government didn't provide for them. And this was same feeling with um, in Belarus with Chernobyl accident, which I also lived through and, and witnessed and sort of this distrust of government and, and, um, and you know, just like simple things like not having toilet paper. <laughs> like what how is this possible these are very different countries and so maybe I had sort of a panic moment and I just wanted to know what happened in the Soviet Union it's like is this happening here so maybe it was just like kind of this moment of sort of this personal kind of 
panic and just and just like okay what are the tools i have to figure out what's happening to me and the people around me okay well i have you know mm-hmm. political science so let's do it and then of course luckily i had zach uh, as, as a partner to to um, kind of balance out my my feelings about things i you know i might turn the question to arajan also you were in kazakhstan right during the pandemic yeah. um I, mean, I know that the the collapse of the soviet union happened before you were born but in the atmosphere there, were people talking about potential parallels between sort of the collapse of the previous order and, and what COVID might rot? Or, or was it just taken as kind of a, a blip that affects Kazakhstan, but doesn't change it? You mean the, the COVID pandemic? Yeah. I honestly, yeah, the, the Soviet collapse happened before I was born. So I'm not very aware of the sentiment that was there, but based on the stories that my grandparents told me or that my pre- parents told me, this was, you know, the, the, the chaos basically ran havoc across the country throughout the period. And uh, it's difficult to compare it to the current uh, state of affairs. Now we see much less panic that was uh, happening back then. So maybe uh, it was to a lesser extent significant the, the recent pandemic in terms of its ramifications for uh, society than the Soviet collapse, even in Kazakhstan. I mean, especially in Kazakhstan, this uh, Central Asia had particular hardships overcoming the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, that's one thing that they that they say when people look at the, the Russian economy and they say it's amazing that it hasn't been hit by COVID as much as Western economies. And the argument is that, well, you know, this, the Russian economy is used to hardships, sanctions, uh, being cut off, like all sorts of problems. So relatively speaking, COVID is just like another little bump that they have to deal with. Whereas the Western economy is not deal, is not used to dealing with supply chain disruptions, lack of toilet paper, like all of these things for us are new. And as a result, they were much more seismic than we would have seen otherwise. I don't know, Yelena, if you have a, a, a feeling about that. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's an interesting point. I haven't thought about, about it this way. Um, Right. I, 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 but what struck me also in some circles, uh, I heard sort of these ideas of, well, we might have a civil war um, because, you know, the, the, the population, there's just so many tensions, there's so much polarization, not just because of the pandemic, but politically as well. And, and that also kind of triggered lots of worries for me. And, and sort of just this idea that if a civil war happened, God forbid, in the United States, the historians 10, 20, 30 years from now would say, oh, it was inevitable, obviously, look at all these indicators, it was bound to happen. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, oh, no. so um so yeah, in terms of resilience of the American population and handling economic shocks, you know, I think ultimately everyone, human beings are just resilient. They want to survive. Um, and so I think, you know, I, 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 you know, it's, there's a new generation in Russia, but, you know, whatever the grandparents went through and the parent, like, I don't, you know, I think they're quite similar to probably their American counterparts and being able to handle uncertainty economically and politically. Yeah, you're right, uh, Dr. Bieberman. I feel like we have a you know completely different mentality, and that there was this generational uh, difference for sure. Now, uh, shifting the discussion back to Bella Veja, and coming from Kazakhstan, I feel like I cannot miss the opportunity to ask this question. I'm personally very interested in the role that Nazarbayev played in this event. You know, as an influential leader of the uh, Soviet Republic, which was not Slavic majority and that had significant nuclear arsenal, Nazarbayev figured prominently in the story, even though he never showed up to Belaveja uh, at the time. And you argue in the podcast that Gorbachev convinced Nazarbayev not to go to Belaveja by offering him a high level position uh, within the reformed USSR. Uh, and then in his personal accounts, Nazarbayev also said repeatedly that even if he had been there, he would never have signed this agreement. Uh, but just 10 days later in Almaty, then capital of the Kazakh SSR in my hometown, the leaders of 11 republics sealed the Belaveja agreement and, and you know, formed the CIS. How did Nazarbayev's attitude and calculus evolve over, evolved over the course of December uh, 1991? And what is your assessment of his role in this event? Uh, why don't we start with Zach, and then I'd love to hear from Dr. Bieberman. Yeah, um, yeah so it, admittedly, I'm not um, incredibly knowledgeable about Nazarbayev's uh, involvement in, in the time going forward after the Belaveja Accords, but I 
the moment where we sort of began to see these inconsistencies in the accounts surrounding Nazarbayev were to me some of the most exciting of, of our research. I think mean, it was the, the inconsistency with the phone call accounts and then the inconsistencies with Nazarbayev's uh, placement, because that's where you start to see these cracks that you can kind of, you know, construct these narratives around. Um, so admittedly, in, in the fourth episode of the podcast, we present what feels like a bit of a far-fetched narrative that not only did Nazarbayev remain in Moscow because of uh, this position that was offered to him, which has been supported by, you know, a couple of different accounts, but also that the men in Belaveja were aware that he was remaining in Moscow and decided to conduct these calls knowing, immediately knowing that that was the case. Um, you know, the evidence to support that lies in the memos of the calls between Yeltsin and Bush uh, and the fact that the calls were placed sort of immediately after uh, this, you know, recognition came to take place. Uh, I, yeah, and I think beyond the actual events, once Gorbachev has received this call and recognized that, you know, Bush has already received the news and that, and that you know, they have the West's support on this, there wasn't much left to be done. And I think that, you know, we've talked about that with regard to Gorbachev and that this peaceful exit after receiving that news seemed like, you know, his main option. But I think that applies to Nazarbayev as well, is that once that situation had played out, there weren't as many options as there might have been, you know, two days prior when, when the length of the remaining years of the Soviet Union was kind of, uh, you know, uncertain. But yeah. Yes, it's a sort of this interesting chess game and, and st still some, some puzzles. So, the, so did Gorbachev know then what was happening in Belavieja? It's it's possible that there were spies. There were people who were kind of keep it, this you know th this delegation. There were multi, you know many people there in the delegations, and somebody was potentially reporting to him what was happening, which then allowed him to make the first move and um, and uh, invite give Nazarbayev power and to prevent him from going to Belavieja. But then Yeltsin makes the phone call to Bush anyway and makes Bush believe that hey yeah Nazarbayev is fine with this. Don't worry. So kind of Yeltsin outplays Gorbachev there um so yeah it's it's a really interesting moment i know that you haven't you haven't really looked at the american reaction to that but one of the things that that comes across is that you know, the americans are really worried about the soviet union dissolving into all of these nationalist small unstable countries some with nuclear weapons um and ultimately that that doesn't really happen so at what point do the Americans like start to understand that this is actually going to be something that could potentially be in their national interests? Um, you know, Elena, I know that this is more kind of on the, the other research that you've done besides on the podcast, but it's interesting to me that, that, you know, Bush and Rice are so against the dissolution of the Soviet Union exactly because they're afraid it's going to increase chaos. And that doesn't really happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the moves to denuclearize uh, Ukraine. I think this was a moment when they realized, okay, you know, this, this will we will be okay. The world will be okay. Um, and so the success in that. It's interesting because taking the nuclear weapons from Ukraine, uh, in doing so, U.S. made a promise to Ukraine that in case if you ever get invaded, we'll come to your aid. Certainly, Ukraine is not part of NATO, but there was. I think it was called the Budapest Memorandum that was signed, sort of this agreement between US and, and Ukraine. And this is, of course, very timely now, now that Russia has, what, about 70,000 troops at the Ukrainian border and looking at the US reaction. Just, it's sort of interesting just to see 30 years later that history is still kind of continuing. Um, and, you know, but yeah, the sort of the anxiety over nuclear weapons, I think, kind of faded with, the, with, with Ukraine giving up its nuclear arms. Uh, now that we're speaking of the peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union, I think Gorbachev's personality is really central to this narrative. Uh, as much as he tried to keep the Soviet Union functioning and as disrespected as he felt by the Slavic Troika, he made this conscious choice of you know, not arresting Yeltsin and company. Uh, to prevent bloodshed. And to put it in your words, Dr. Biberman, you said that Gorbachev's aversion to violence and his respect for human life ultimately allowed the USSR's uh, peaceful dissolution. If we look at the public opinion polls in the modern day in Russia, opinions on Gorbachev are overwhelmingly negative. 
Do you think that if we shed more light on the role of his responsibility for this peaceful dissolution, that would have changed by any means? That's an interesting question. And there's also a question, how do does the Russian public or you know, post-Soviet public feel about the dissolution? Um, and that also might matter with generation, or, you know. So, but um, yeah, it's it's interesting. There's there is that important role of agency on the part of Gorbachev in terms of uh, the the outcome, the, the peaceful dissolution. So here is like true evidence of very uh, strong agency being played because it it could have gone very differently had he. Um, Again, had he been a different kind of leader, and uh, we see that kind of leader kind of more and more around the world. So, so we, you know, it's important to take a moment and recognize how leadership matters and what he did it has, was kind of remarkable and to learn from that. And yeah, like, I don't know, could it be a source of pride in Russia? I'm not sure. There's just <laughs> there's so much. There's some who feel it was a big loss. Um, I know certainly Putin has felt that, um, has voiced uh, this notion, this, this was a big tragedy, the, the solution of the Soviet Union, like it didn't have to happen. Um, so I think maybe with generations as people come to terms with the dissolution and feel that it was a good thing, sort of feel like they benefited from it, um, then they could, then Gorbachev would re-emerge as a hero. But I think history is full of people who don't get enough credit, so. You know, there, there's a question in the chat about um, the Chinese being amazed that no shots were fired when the Soviet Union was dissolved, right? I mean, if it was something that so many people had a stake in, why is it that there was no resistance to it being dissolved, right? And it, is it that the dissolution actually spoke to what people were looking for? Was there such a sense of disappointment that they thought only change could bring something better? And do you have a sense for how, how Gorbachev resisted sort of the call of violence, especially since it had happened, right? In some of the other republics, there had been violence. Yeah, so sort of what was happening in his own head? I mean, I know he's had memoirs and lots of interviews and still, you know, it's, I guess, just sort of his personality. <laughs> I'm not sure, but also just, again, speaking from my lived experience and witnessing at least what I was witnessing in Babruisk, a small town in Belarus, Again, people were just not paying attention, I think. And there was just like a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty. Again, having to stand in line just for like food and toilet paper. <laughs> and, um, it was just consuming everyone. And there was this acceptance of like, you know, surprises eventually. It's sort of, oh, of course. And I remember we left the Soviet Union exactly one year after it collapsed. And my family still, we didn't know what we were leaving. Were we leaving the Soviet Union? We're leaving Russia? We're leaving Belarus? We didn't know. So, so when we're even applying to American passport, three years later, uh, my mother ended up writing, we came from Russia, even though it's Belarus. And it's still, it's been impossible to change since then <laughs> because we were so confused. What, what, what is the country that we're leaving? So, so um, potentially violence was averted by just like this sheer confusion, right? So that, that ties into a question that we have, which is that, um, you know, the Russian public might have felt that a union with Belarus and Ukraine is sort of like, that's natural because these are all Slavic people. Um, and so, you know, what Nazarbayev does or what the, what the other Central Asian republics do or even what the Baltics do, like it's kind of irrelevant because the, the heart of the Soviet Union is in fact the Slavic countries. Um, and I guess the question is like, were, were there Russian protests about losing these central parts of Russian identity. You know, what part of the narrative that we hear now about Ukraine is that the Russians say that the Ukrainians are actually part of Russian history. And the Ukrainians are like, no, thank you. Like we're part of our own history, not yours. But there's definitely a mismatch between how the Ukrainians see their, their joint history and how the Russians see it. And what was the sentiment then? Was it as, as acutely felt as it is now? Yeah, and again, I can, we have an expert here at Skidmore College, Kate Brainy, who features in the podcast, um, who is, this is her specialty. Uh, I can speak again, since you kind of asked about my experience. My understanding as a Belarusian was that there was a sense that Belarus and Russia are basically the same. There is like, it was, we were confused about why Belarus became independent, at least, you know, me and everyone. <laughs> um, 
in terms of Ukraine, honestly, I never had a sense of feeling like, oh, we have to have Ukraine. Like, I just never got that. I know there's this narrative, well, Kivian Rus, right? That's where the roots come from. But like, I just never had that feeling, especially because my identity was more attached to Soviet Union. And the founder, for me, the founding was Lenin, the Bolshevik party, not Kivian Rus, like emotionally, as, as the way that I was kind of trained, like socialized in the Soviet Union. So I just, I never felt that like deep, connection, primordial connection to Ukraine. So honestly, when I hear that, that argument, this kind of cultural argument about the Russian soul and the need for Ukraine to be part of like that, I, I, I don't buy it personally, but you know, that's just me maybe. <laughs> and in Kazakhstan, does do you hear any of that, Arjan? And sort of, you know, the Ukrainians and the Russians, like they have their own thing, but we're separate? Uh, in, in terms of like the the impact of the Soviet collapse on like uh, Central Asia, I believe that the the prominent line of thinking is that Central Asian republics were always considered kind of a burden on the on the Slavic republics that were out there, and maybe there was even some part of you know being actually glad that the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, this feeling of you know, satisfaction within Moscow that they no longer have to supply and uh, provide for Central Asian republics. But if we uh, think about like current assessments of the Soviet Union's collapse in Central Asia, there seems to be this clear intergenerational uh, difference. So my parents, for example, would say, oh, there were many good things in the Soviet Union. I believe there is even more nostalgia among like grandparents' generation. But my generation, people who are not born in the Soviet Union and have never uh, seen what it is like to live in the Soviet Union, I, I believe that there is not really much nostalgia uh, taking place. And do you, do you feel, sorry, I'm, I'm asking you personally, Arjan, now you, I mean, <laughs> do you, do you feel some affinity to, to Russia or to Ukraine because those countries were once part of a common country or is it just like totally irrelevant to what's going on now? No, I think we do feel this affinity, uh, and I personally do, not only because I study uh, Russia and the region, but also because of linguistic affinity. Even though I never lived in the Soviet Union, every new year I watch uh, Ironia Sujbui, the <laughs> Destiny, I still have a lot of connection to the Soviet things. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Soviet ice cream, it's legendary. Everybody <laughs> knows about it. So yeah, uh, I would say there is the sense of affinity still. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just not as pronounced as among the elder generations. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting it still exists, right? I mean, obviously the language plays a big role and, and in certain uh, former republics more than others, right? In Kazakhstan, many people still speak Russian. Whereas if you go to Georgia, it's only older people who speak Russian. Um, but it, but it's yeah. interesting that there's still some kind of common cultural um, sort of touchstones mm -hmm. for the younger generation that never experienced kind of Russia as the same country. Sorry, Yelena. Yeah, go. yeah. so yeah, I, again, I'm surprised to hear from Arujan about, you know, watching Ironia Sujbe is looking part of it. <laughs> Your generation. Uh, but I think, you know, this cultural affinity um, exist not just because of language, uh, but also, and this is something that's underappreciated in the United States and the West, but the cultural production of the Soviet Union was out of this world. Like it was incredible. Uh, the movies, the songs, the just, you know, poetry, like just art, it was, um, you know, it, I guess it's not something that really penetrated into the United States and that's unfortunate, but there's a lot to discover there. And I think, that, you know, and, and so it, it still sort of tugs at the strings of generations. And Zach was telling me about his generation of those who, you know, did not grow up during Cold War, but are kind of when they, when they are kind of exposed to elements of Soviet culture, it's attractive. Zach, could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so I we talked about this in the first episode of the podcast a bit, um, but it's something that really caught my eye this past year that uh, this Belarusian uh, electronic band uh, called Molchat Doma kind of gained a lot of popularity on TikTok. Um, and what the trend was, was it, it's people living, uh, predominantly people living in Russia or, you know, other former Soviet countries would post sort of, you know, aesthetic videos of usually in industrial settings um, set to that music. And it gained a lot of traction and popularity in the West um, to the point where, you know, this, this Belarusian band is playing, uh, I'm going to see them play a concert in Brooklyn in a couple of weeks. Um, and it, 
I remember there was an interview with the person that uploaded the original video that gained a lot of traction. And what he was saying was that, you know, a lot of people in their twenties use that sort of aestheticization of, uh, you know, industrial Soviet era, like eighties Soviet union as an escape. It's, it's a form of escapism for American, um, you know, young Americans who, who feel, you know, very, uh, trapped and, and, you know, at odds with, with a capitalist system. And I, I thought that was, you know, really interesting because it, it feels very different from any other sort of cultural production out of, you know, uh, those countries that I've seen, in, you know, in my lifetime, at least. And you're nodding your head, like, you know, exactly what TikTok videos Zach is talking about. Me or Arjan? Arjan. <laughs> oh, I would have I no idea. you're too old for TikTok. <laughs> I don't, thank you, exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have heard about Molchat Dama so frequently recently, and uh, but I have not. I, I don't have a huge presence on TikTok. On TikTok, but I would really love to, you know. Now since I hear it from everybody, I'll certainly do that afterwards. Yeah, and this is why I found it so great to work with Zach, um, because he introduced me to these modern things that I've been so removed from and to know that there's this life of the Soviet Union that I'm not aware of uh, you know on TikTok or an afterlife uh, the Soviet Union yeah an afterlife like or Instagram <laughs> or whatever <laughs> but actually that's, that's one question I wanted to ask you like what is it that you discovered while making a podcast about an ostensibly academic subject right I mean you could have written an article about it but instead you took a much more personal kind of exploratory I would even say multimedia type of approach to it what did you discover that you probably wouldn't have if you had been pursuing this as an academic article and I would ask Elena first and then Zach sort of as someone who's more of a student what is it that you kind of uncovered that you didn't expect yeah that's Great question. I think by using this medium instead of the typical, I was thinking about writing an academic article. I'm like, oh, this could even be a book. And they're like, no, no, no. And the reason I was, after getting tenure at Skidmore, I, I wanted to do something creative. There's a lot of, they have this creative thought matters, which just this notion that, you know, just trying something new, taking risks. And I know at RICA, which is a very interdisciplinary program, just sort of being exposed to, you know, being comfortable across disciplines. Not So, so, I like I big fan of podcasts. Wind of change is really kind of like what triggered a lot of this for me, and so I thought, well, why not? Why not try? And um, and so sort of discovered that you know through this medium is sort of being in that space of uncertainty and not knowing and not having all the answers, not knowing exactly what happened, but feeling like I'm closer to understanding, even though there's sort of multiple kind of alternatives, but like I feel closer to. So it's sort of it was understanding something. Um, better and more viscerally through through this more creative medium and also again I don't know why I keep <laughs> being surprised by this but like every time I hear sort of how this new generation just like doesn't have that baggage so sort of I when I came to the U.S. and sort of I carried so much baggage almost of shame of being from the Soviet Union like like I like I belong to this uh, evil empire and and um, sort of it was just really backward society. Um, and sort of I carried this with me and I think it's something that I deeply internalized. And then just to have a generation like does not has these, does not have these preconceived notions about that society and those people, again, polit you know, politically there, we can talk about that, but just like as the human beings there are sort of seen as, you know, normal people, like just, it's kind of, I found that remarkable. <laughs> um, yeah, on, on my end, I. This was also obviously, you know, a very personal project for me. Um, and even though I completed it in my senior year as like kind of an unofficial undergraduate thesis, um, it, it was really great to be able to to spend all this time on it. And I think for someone like me who for the majority of this process was an undergraduate, something that, that felt very powerful about the podcast format was the difference between including an audio clip of someone you've interviewed versus, uh, you know, writer typing in a block quote from someone for a book. I, you know, I, I'm not presenting this product as, and you know, we're not presenting this product as, as purely our voices. You know, there's so many people who we've talked to and we've worked with that it, it doesn't feel like an individual thing anymore. Uh, and I think, I mean, obviously, you know, our individual lives are important to it, but it felt much more powerful to be able to, one, include people's actual voices and, and you know, flush that out in that way. Uh, but also to be able to speak with, you know, I, I interviewed uh, Timothy Tolton, Yeltsin's biographer, uh, for this project. And I, 
in all my time, you know, writing papers in, in college, I never got to interview people who were so directly related to uh, the things that I was, you know, researching and trying, trying to work on. So that, that was very amazing as well. And sort of just, yeah, that's the sort of professor student relationship and sort of seeing how far it can take you and how, you know, they, you know, talk about like, oh, you know, we learn from our students, but like, we actually do. <laughs> like, it's a real thing. And um, sort of this, this product is just, a, you know, just working together. And uh, like what Zach said, it's, you know, does not sort of, no contribution is individual at this point. It's sort of just creative minds. And again, bouncing ideas, making mistakes together, laughing about it, trying again and again and again. It's sort of this is something I learned about from artists is sort of making mistakes. And but you, you just have to try many times before you get the final product. Um, yeah, that, so it was just very rewarding for me. And I think it sort of opened up my mind, gave me like a, a stronger voice or more confident voice moving forward. Before, as an academic, if I didn't know something, I felt like mm, I shouldn't talk about it or, you know. I, like who, who, you know, who am I? But but then it's like, well, not knowing is sort of is also something that is worth, in, you know, interrogating and and, and learning from. <laughs> you know, that that's something that I, I thought you both did very well. Is that there's there's a very kind of democratizing um, atmosphere in the podcast, and it, it does kind of reflect in the same way that Winds of Change kind of says, you know, we have this question and we don't know what the answer is, but let's see how other people answer it, right? And and kind of going to look for information in a way that validates, you know, both Yelena's opinion and Zach's opinion and Timothy Colton's opinion, kind of that everyone has the right to their opinion. And then we're trying to understand it, but we may not actually understand the way things actually are. And, and that's kind of reality, right? When we think that everything is so tidy and wrapped up, like it's an illusion, right? But but there's something about the way that you, you present the information that makes it clear. Like there are things we know, there are things we don't know, and there are things we can guess about, but we won't really know the final answer. Yes, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, because if we, you know, as academics, when we write about things that we feel like we have an answer to, then we can't really tackle too much. There, there are still sort of bigger, sometimes something really big, as big as sort of why did the Soviet Union collapse or how did it collapse? How did, how did this big global transformation take place? This is like such an, a major event, but it's been ignored for so long, maybe because it just didn't fit, neat, fit neatly into any of the boxes that we had before, including our concepts. You know, like again, what what to call something like this? So it, it hasn't been really ever used as a case study of anything, um, because like, what do you compare it to? So I would I would ask you, you Yelena as a professor, and you Zach as a student, right, an undergraduate, and maybe even Arjan as a graduate student. Like from from this experience and from listening to the podcast, what do you take away from it? Yeah. So for me, <laughs> this one. Um, I think it's actually quite hopeful. It could be a scary idea, but it's hopeful. It's that anything could happen, including very, very big things. So sometimes there's sort of a sense of fatalism in politics, the sense of like, well, this is how things always are and will be. And, you know, change is impossible. Um, again, this could be scary because change could be bad, but it could also be good. So this sort of fatalism that many of us bring to, you know, politically to the political arena, to our lives, need not be there. That something as major as the collapse of a superpower can just like happen unexpectedly in a weekend and then we're done. <laughs> How about you, Zach? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's about what my main takeaway has been to question sort of accepted narratives uh, that, you know, I've been taught throughout my life and that funnel into the way I think about things more than I, you know, often expect them to. I, I, when I started working on the podcast, I think I would not have defined myself as someone who is affected by, you know, the U.S. narrative about Russia. I would say, oh, you know, I'm from a Russian family. This is like just how other people view it. But in examining the way that these things, you know, affect history, you also examine the way that it affects your own, you know, conceptualization of yourself. And so I think since then, I, I've, you know, just thought more about that with other kinds of narratives that, that play into it, who I am. And how about you, Arjan? Did this podcast change the way you, you look at the world or you look at your, your education? Actually, it did. Yeah. Having studied political science and IR for my entire undergrad and still studying this, we tend to mainly look at, you know, institutional variables, structural variables. And the structural focus 
sometimes really does not give enough credit to personalities. And really my takeaway was that personalities matter, coincidences matter and spontaneity matters, which you know I think is a very important thing for me to remember as I proceed with my research. All right. Well, I think that is the perfect ending to our conversation. Not only does spontaneity and conversation matter, but obviously bringing together the right people at the right time in the right hunting lodge also matters. And I would consider that this virtual hunting lodge has produced some very excellent results. So thank you so much for all contributing to this wonderful conversation. Please tune in with us next Wednesday. So a week from today at 1230 for Yelena's conversation with Shushkevich, which will be in English, but translated for those who don't speak, oh no, so in Russian, but translated into English for those who don't speak Russian and will allow us to explore some of these questions as we continue commemorating the 30th anniversary of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Thank you all to everybody.